Father, we thank you for the wonderful times that we have together, and I pray that the words that have been spoken will find room that would lead our students and everybody here to eternity, for that is really the main reason why we are here. And at the same time, while waiting for your soon coming, to keep ourselves faithful and at the same time to cast a positive influence to those around us, that we may also let others see the joy and the happiness that radiates from our hearts and that they would like to follow you. And once again, as I am going to open your word, dear Father, I pray that you are going to give me the unction of the Holy Spirit to speak your words. It is such an awesome responsibility to be speaking on your behalf, and I pray that I will be doing exactly like that. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our text and our scriptures of meditation is found in Acts 3, verses 1 to 8. I'm not going to read all of these verses. And we know the story very well. Now Peter and John went together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, or three o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, being lame from birth from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms to them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something to them, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. One of the very devastating aspects of giving life to a person is really it is because you don't know what's going to be the outcome. As parents... When we are going to have children, we always expect that the child is going to become normal and that the child is going to be somebody someday, isn't it? I wonder whether we have actually thought when we are going to have a child that, oh, this child is going to be the next top criminal here in Kenya. We never make that actually thought because we always are very optimistic 
that when we are going to have children, we pray that they are going to be successful, they are going to prove productive to society, not only that, but also would be of benefit to you and to me. Now just imagine that this child was actually born, and it says that this man was born lame from his womb. Now I, did not, I do not know how they were able to diagnose that the man was already crippled in the womb because at the time they don't have all of these ultrasounds and these scans. But I think they just came up with a conclusion when the boy, maybe at two years old, could no longer walk. Now can you just imagine a boy being born, and especially in a Jewish society, when a boy is born, you actually have a lot of expectations. I don't know here in Kenya whether you enjoy having a boy or a girl, but I think in most cultures, it is really that the boy that you expect. China, for instance, they really want to have boys, you see. And so when the boy was born, I'm sure there was great rejoicing in the family. Maybe after a year, they started to realize that this boy could not even crawl. I'm sure as parents, you know what we call the stages of development, because at one year old, this boy should be able to crawl. Not only that, but maybe able to stand up. And so they just began to think that there must be something wrong with this boy. And I could just see that these parents had some thoughts and then started to pray and say, God, I hope that you are going to make this boy normal. And maybe after about one year and a half, and by the time, many of the children are able to walk. Yet the boy is not able to walk. So finally, they brought the boy to a doctor and find out if there is something wrong with the boy. And of course, we as doctors, we try to be very positive. We don't immediately give you the good news. What we always tell you is that, you know, maybe this boy has what we call a delayed development. And let's just wait for a couple of weeks and find out whether he would be able to walk. And I'm sure after they visited the doctor, then they started again to pray. But then after two years, it was clear that the boy could not walk. And I'm sure they even asked the church to pray for this boy. The family prayed for the boy. And of course, as the boy maybe reached three years old or four years old, they told him, I'm sorry, but you know, it seems that you are really born lame. And they even told the boy to pray. Now, it actually says here that the man was brought into the temple to pray. And ironically, where he was placed was called beautiful. <laughs> that is such an irony. We're in a beautiful place and that you have somebody who could not walk. So considering what we call the Jewish society, what do you think is a definition of a man? What do you think is the definition of a man? I think here in Kenya, maybe as you reach 18 years old, you're going to have the right of passage. And maybe at 21 years old, you're considered to be an adult to be able to vote. But in the Jewish society, it was different. You have to be what we call 30 years old to be considered to be a man. So as we look into this story, you can see that this man was at least 30 years old, and every day they brought this man into the temple so that he could ask for alms. And it is unfortunate because in the end they begin to realize there is nothing that we can do, and the only productive thing that he can do is to go into the temple and beg for alms. So every day they brought him to the temple for alms. Now you can just see the series of prayers that were being said by the family, by the man himself, and maybe by the church, and yet nothing had happened. Until Peter and John came, and when they came, he actually says to this man, look unto us, silver and gold have I none, but such as we have, give I unto thee. And immediately the man was made well. A miracle that day, wasn't it? Rejoicing. I could just see people rejoicing. But what is interesting is what Peter, what Peter had said, silver and gold have I none, but such as we have, we give to thee. 
My friends, like it or not, all of us have something to give. I was so thrilled this morning. We're in the women's ministries of this church in behalf of the church. We went to this project where they have HIV positive people and a lot of orphans. And they went out to give clothes and food and also spiritual nourishment. Why? It's because they had something to give. I was so happy to see that some of the students even went out together with us to be able to give. And I tell you, one of the big problems that Kenya is facing today is the pandemic of HIV. 1.6 million people here in Kenya are actually suffering from HIV, and many of them are what we call destitute and poor. It is true that the government is giving medications, but I tell you, medications without food does not help. And HIV is a disease of poverty. Some women, even because of their being so poor, they sell themselves so that they would be able to have money to buy food. And some of them whom we have actually asked, they tell us, I would rather die of HIV than die of hunger. Well, all of us will frown. Many of us are going to, be to frown with a type of what we call Darwinian survival strategy. But really, if you look at it purely at a Darwinian viewpoint, it is logical. Why is because if you are not going to eat, you will die between 40 to 50 days. That's guaranteed. Whereas if you are going to get HIV today, it might take about three years before you are going to feel the effects of the virus and maybe another two years before you're going to finally die. But the good news these days is that there are medications. So there is no need. But it is a wrong strategy in the eyes of God, and we have to teach these women that it is wrong. And as I said, medications are there, but there are no food. I challenge the church to actually take on responsibility and to take on programs wherein you are able to help so many people out there. It is only a matter of identifying. One thing you can do, you can even put a box in front of the church and say, okay, today we are going to collect clothes for people who are destitute and needy. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of responses because I am sure all of us have clothes more than one, isn't it? All of us have bags more than five. All of us have shoes maybe more than two or three. Not only that, but we have also extra food in our homes. Like they say, okay, we are going to collect food. And I tell you, you can just see how much you're able to help because what you have, you can give. And I'm sure this church have a lot of resources that they can give. It is not only with the HIV, but there are so many out there who are destitute and needed. And yet in your houses, you have what we call overflowing with goods. But I'm so thankful that the church is starting with that, and I was so thrilled when Women's Ministries tells me that they are actually embarking in another station. Praise the Lord for that. And I could see the joy of the people who went there and participated. You can just hear the singing, the liveliness, because when we are going to share our blessings with others, we are going to be a recipient of happiness also. But you see, if I'm going to ask you, what do we have that you are going to give? And I'm sure the first thing that you are going to give me is your Facebook account, isn't it? Or maybe your cell phone numbers. Or whatever. But I tell you what is important is we give Jesus Christ to somebody who comes into our lives. And unfortunately... Some people are so full of anger that they give anger to somebody, isn't it? Some people are so full with profanity that as you talk to them, immediately every sentence is punctuated with cursing. Some people are so full of hate that you can see it oozing from them. And I pray all of us have certain diseases, but I pray we're not going to give our diseases to somebody, okay? But anyway... So what we have, definitely we are going to give consciously or unconsciously. That is the rule of life. But here is the moral of the story. So, as I said, it is very possible that this man and the family in the church was praying for so long and that a miracle never happened. 
God had to wait for the presence of Peter and John to be able to perform a miracle. And I tell you, God is waiting on each one of you here to be able to use you as a miracle. It is just for us to be able to grasp the opportunity so that we can be used as a miracle. 30 years of praying and yet nothing happens. And yet when John and Peter enters into the temple, a miracle just happens. I pray that you are going to become that miracle because you can actually answer the prayers of many. We saw a lot of orphans out there. And I tell you, some of these orphans don't have food. Some of these orphans don't have any clothing. But you can be the answer to the prayers of those orphans who are out there. I challenge you and each one of us to be able to be that miracle that God wants you to be. But anyway, God had actually given me the opportunity to just be an answer to somebody's prayer. While we were in Zambia, serving in a very remote mission hospital, and that mission hospital was also a leprosarium. One day, somebody actually came and said, Doctor, I have actually been to many medical doctors, and I have been told that I am all right, but yet I am confined in a wheelchair. This man was in a wheelchair for seven months. And when I saw him, he was actually dragging himself with that wheelchair. I looked into his chart and I could see many of the laboratory tests were already done. Many of the examinations were done. And I could also see that there was nothing really wrong with him. But I told him, Mr. Cabasso, there is nothing that I can do more. But here is what I can do. I can actually pray for you. We serve a God who is all-powerful, who can perform miracles. And I prayed for him and forgot about the whole thing. Forgot totally about him. Ten years down the line, while I was in North Zambia conducting similar these health meetings, as I was coming down of the airplane, here comes this man waving to me, Dr. Leguno. I said, who is this man who is waving so eagerly at me. And so finally, I got to see him. I said, hey, brother, how are you? He said, do you remember me? I said, I'm so sorry. I meet so many people, and unfortunately, that can be true to some of you here whom I have met. And because of the plethora of faces that I see, then I forget their names. But he said, you should remember me, doctor, because I was the person you prayed for 10 years ago. I was in a wheelchair, and after you prayed for me, two weeks after, I was able to walk. I'm so glad that the Lord has actually used me, was through the power of Jesus Christ, but I tell you, what if I hesitated to offer that prayer? What if I hesitated to say, you know, I don't think God is going to answer this man? My friends, God is waiting for the opportunity to be able to use us. And I'm so thankful that God had used me and that I allowed God to use me. And so this man now, because he is so happy that God had performed a miracle, he was on his two feet. He actually was working in the conference as a health ministries director. As a response, as a thanks to God. But you see, the problem with these miracles right now is that there are so many miracles that are going out there and we do not know whether they come from God. And God actually gave us a warning, which is found in Revelation 16, 14, which says, For they are the spirits of devil working miracles, which go forth to the kings of this earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the God Almighty. My friends, as we are going to see more and more miracles that are going to happen, we have to be very careful that there is a bogus that is going on there. How do we know? We go into Genesis, I mean Exodus 7, starting from verse 10, and that's the story about Moses. <laughs> God had told Moses, appeared in a burning bush, Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Do you think Moses was excited? I'm sure Moses had actually declared, God, who am I that I am going to face the most powerful man at the time. And it's true because Pharaoh at the time was the most powerful man. 
But God said, I'm going to equip you. I'm going to fortify you. And so he tells Moses, throw your rod. And of course, when Moses throws his rod, it becomes a serpent. You know, the story. <laughs> I can just see the excitement in the face of Moses. <laughs> I am going to show Pharaoh that I am able to do it. So, okay, God, I'm going to go to Pharaoh. And he makes an appointment with Pharaoh. He even barging into the palace and said, I want to see Pharaoh. God said, who are you? Well, I'm Moses from God. And when the guards let him in, and when the guards let him in, immediately Moses tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh points his bony finger and dressed in a shepherd's clothes and even stinking and even smelling of the desert because he was taking care of sheep. Jehovah said, let my people go. Hey, Pharaoh looks at this. Who are you, by the way? I tell you, God says, let my, faith, my people go. And so Moses said, well, if you're not going to let the Israelites go, I'm going to show you what God wants me to show you. And immediately he throws his rod back. It becomes a snake. Now, I'm sure if you were there, you would be saying, oh, wow, unbelievable. But do you think Pharaoh was impressed? But do you think Pharaoh was impressed? Pharaoh actually says, is that all? Moses, is that all? Boys, come boys, and show Moses what you can do. And immediately his voice comes up, boom, back, becomes a snake. See, Moses, can you see I'm just like you, God? But what happens? The snake of Pharaoh, I mean the snake of Moses started to eat the snakes of the magician. And that's it. As I said, here are two powers that are going on. The power of Satan comes from the devil. And that's the reason why we're emphasizing on this. Because there are a lot of miracle healings that are going on there. This actually shows you the confrontation between good and evil. And as we know, God always wins. But you see, you have to realize that there is a distinction between God and Satan. Now you ask the question, why is it that God had actually decided to use a serpent when Moses threw his rod? What do you think? You students of theology, maybe you have an answer. It would be impressive, isn't it, if when Moses threw his rod, it becomes a wah, roaring lion, and that would really scare people, isn't it? Or when he threw his rod, it was going to become a charging elephant. Wow. Imagine a big elephant in the room all of a sudden. But why a snake? God does not do things in random, remember. There is always a purpose. You see, the snake is actually a symbol of Egypt. Go into any history and go into the pictures of the Pharaoh and you can see that their crown and their mitre actually has a snake. They actually have the two cobras in their mitre because you see the cobra represents the Nile. The lower Nile and the upper Nile. The lower Nile which is actually in Cairo and the upper Nile which is in Luxor. Two snakes. In fact, Cleopatra, who actually killed herself, decides to have a cobra bite her. She said, I don't want to be killed by any ordinary mortal. I should be killed by a god, a cobra. So can you just imagine, here in Africa, you have what they call a totem, isn't it? Totem of families. I was very obvious in Zimbabwe, I don't know, here in Kenya, where the families of totem, a symbol of the families. And your totem is going to be eaten. For instance, if your family totem is going to be a rooster, and you go to another house and they're going to serve a rooster, that means they're going to eat you. When the magicians actually saw that the snake was being swallowed, they went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, this is bad. We are going to be defeated. 
But of course, Pharaoh, because he did not want his pride to be hurt, oh, let's fight against God. And we know the conclusion of the story. My friends, God does not execute any judgment before giving us a warning. And I know some of us have been doing things that are irregular, and you still you continue with it, but God actually lets you continue because He just wants to give you warning. But here is the problem that is going on because we have these spurious miracles that are happening these days, which many are sucked into. What you're basically doing is you're asking a favor from Satan, and when you ask a favor from somebody, there is going to be pay time, isn't it? Payback time. Isn't it? When somebody does you a favor, there's always payback time. Now, we have some, seen so many of these happenings. People coming up in a wheelchair, and they go to these meetings, and all of a sudden, here comes this miracle healing. Stand up! And all of a sudden, this person who is crippled even throws his crutches and even walks off from the wheelchair. Oh! Praise the Lord, isn't it? Well, the devil has some limited powers. He comes from heaven and he knows a little of those powers and God has given him. And some of them get cured, but I challenge you to look at those people, go and trace them in their houses, and many of them actually are going to be sick again. Why? It's because when they are going to come to these miracle healings, they have actually decided to let Satan possess them. So, as they are actually even crippled, and they are actually maimed, Satan's angels are going to go inside of them. Is it possible? Have you seen people who are possessed? Hey, one time we had actually a baptism. I did an evangelistic meeting, and the woman was actually a witch. We tried to baptize her. Five people had to put her into the pool to be able to really dunk her into the water. Five people. That is how strong they are. That same power that Satan actually does when a person is possessed by the devil, he can tame it, and a person who is in a wheelchair, because he's using the power of Satan. Everybody is smiling. Everybody is clapping. That is the very reason why, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, in our 28 fundamental doctrines, we do not stress miracle as one of our beliefs. Because you see, miracles can be counterfeited by Satan. Look into our fundamental doctrines. And I know some churches actually are going to say, hey, does your church have miracles? I tell you, we say yes, but we do not brag about it. Because we don't want people to be using miracles as the basis. Yes, it is true. Health is the right hand of the message of God, but Satan too has his right hand. And as we were discussing about health, this is the reason why I came to the conclusion that I have to tell you that we have to be very careful for health because Satan is also going to use the health message. Really, in the final analysis, what happens to all those miracles, even the miracles that Jesus performed? The blind man finally died. The crippled man finally died, and Lazarus also finally died, isn't it? Whether there are going to be miracles, they shall come to an end, my friends. That's why it is not important. It is not very important. I mean, basically, we should not put our faith when it comes to miracles. But rather, let us put our faith and our trust according to Matthew 17, 18. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For I tell you, not one jot or one tittle is going to pass till everything is going to be fulfilled. With a type of words, which do you think is important? Miracles or the Word of God? Which is important? Heaven and earth or the Word of God? God placed number one premium His Word. And this is it. That should be the guidelines and the basis of our faith. Not any sensationalism, not any miracles or anything else. 
My friends, I pray that we are going to use the Word of God as the basis of our lives and the basis of our faith. Because heaven and earth can pass away. That is how irrelevant heaven and earth is to God. But not His Word. But how about us? Are we making God's Word the basis of our lives or are we actually even working contrary to the Word of God? When examinations come, okay, is that the Word of God? When you make your thesis, oh, I tell you, there was an economic or cultural minister in Germany who actually even lost her position because she was caught plagiarizing her doctoral degree. How about if we are tempted sexually to become impure or unfaithful? Are we going to rely on our feelings or are we going to say, I stand with the word of God? My friends, heaven and earth will pass away, but not God's word. I pray that we are going to take seriously God's word. Because even if we are going to die, even if this world is going to be finished, all God has to do is say, live again, and you will live again. Even if this world and this heaven is going to be destroyed, God can just say, let there be a new heaven and a new earth, and everything will come, because that is how powerful His Word is. More powerful than the heavens and the earth, it is God's Word. Let us take God's Word seriously. Thank God for that message. In the afternoon, Dr. Liaguno will lead us in a health discussion. You are welcome at 3 o'clock. He will lead us in prayer right away. Then we will remain standing as we sing threefold truth. Then we will disperse. Bow down our heads for prayer. Dear Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that I can break the bread of life. I thank you for the opportunity that I am together with these wonderful students and faculty and to be in your institution. Father, I know there is a reason why you have placed this institution in such a strategic location. I pray that it is going to fulfill the very reason that you have made it exist, and that is to follow your word. I pray that all the basis of our actions, all the basis of our life, all our transactions will be actually based in God's word. May it be that you'll give us that faith that is never going to waver, a faith that will trust you no matter what. May the Lord preserve your coming and going in now, for henceforth and forevermore, until the day that he is going to claim us into the heavenly home, is my prayer. In the loving name of Jesus, amen.